Welcome to another special edition of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. I'm standing in front of the stamp mill, which is located at the Superstition Mountain Museum. And today, we're going to be talking with Larry Hedrick. You have a little bit to do with this stamp mill that we're sitting in front of uh, at the Superstition Mountain Museum. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it, the history, and how you got involved? You know, I've always heard that truth is stranger than fiction. and. Uh, how this stamp mill came about, the donation of this stamp mill, was one of the most unusual things that a person could think of. It came out of the blue. In fact, it was the result of another donation that brought about this one. When a fledgling museum that doesn't have a museum is I can't expect to get money from anybody. So we were very active in pursuing donations. And I had made arrangements with Phelps Dodge to meet with their people down into headquarters in Phoenix. And they informed us that they were tearing down the, duction, the reduction bill down at Douglas. And uh, they called the fellow that was in charge of the operation down there and told them we were coming. And we went down and uh, selected the stuff that we wanted. Then we put together a convoy of two flatbed semis and a big box truck. And I notified all the papers in Tucson and Phoenix and the TV stations, and even Bill Leverton, because I'd done some things with the Arizona Road, and he went with us on this trip. Well, however it works, that was reprinted by one of the newspapers in the Albuquerque newspaper. And since my name was mentioned, Mr. Joseph Jones called me at home one night, and he told me that he had a 20 stamp mill that he'd like to donate to us. So one of the board members, Ed Seifert, had a light plane, and, and he took the president, Clay Wurst, who, was, uh, who owns a gold mine, and myself to Albuquerque, and he run us up uh, about uh, three quarters of the way to Santa Fe, up to the 8,000 foot level in Jimenez Forest. And there was the town of Bland. And we surveyed the whole operation and looked the mill over and um, reported back to the board what we thought. Larry, it's amazing that you got this here. Now, I know there's, I think, about four other mills here in Arizona that are in various degrees of being able to work, but this one's a fully functioning stamp mill. How did you get it here and working? Well, I pondered for the longest time what kind of equipment it would take to tear that building down and get this stuff out of there. But we were in the process of making a deal with Goldfield Ghost Town with Bob Schuess about locating our museum at Goldfield. And they were going to supply us with a shell building. In fact, we were the only th the third business that, was th that came to Goldfield. And we, of course, had to do all the interior, the electric, the sheetrock, and, and everything. But he needed lumber. So we made the deal that he got all the lumber that didn't have anything to do with the stamp mill, and we got the stamp mill. How did you move this thing? There again, he had a front end loader, and that was the only piece of equipment that we had to, to, to complete this entire operation. Uh, Hank Brown, again, a fellow that uh, has been involved uh, with the museum for a long time and was on the F Douglas trip and uh, many other trips, uh, he was the independent trucker. We made a contract with him to do all the hauling. He made five 1,000-mile round trips, bringing the stamp mill over there and, and some of the lumber, which, which mostly was loaded on a separate trailer. And uh, we spent 28 days taking this mill down. And um, the most amazing thing about it was absolutely nobody got hurt, not even a pulled fingernail. I did throw a disc out the second day, but I, there was nothing you could do but keep going. And uh, the teardown was, uh, was complete. And then, of course, when we got back over to um, Goldfield, uh, Bob put the stamp mill up at Goldfield. And it stayed there until we found this property. And after the property was found and it was, uh, the museum was being built, Hank Brown and I again, alone, moved the stamp mill, tore it down at Goldfield, and brought it down over here and put it back up, just the two of us, and with the boom trucks. Um, about three weeks, I guess, after we were done, 
I got another phone call from Mr. Jones. And his first words is, he says, Larry, he says the Smithsonian was here. Huh, the Smithsonian, what do they want? He said, well, they contacted me five or six years ago, and they said they'd like to have the stamp mill. And I said they could have it, and I never heard from them again. And when I read the story about you guys, I decided to give it to you. He said they had raised $50,000 to take it to Washington, D.C. And all I could say is you're a little late. <laughs> anyway, the operation of putting this all back together, uh, of course, the first thing we did was uh, I had to buy a tractor. You know, the museum didn't have any money. And there was a tractor sitting about two miles south with a, with a, a front loader on it. And I, bu I bought a cannon and a post hole digger and stuff that we needed for around here. And we leveled this area and built a little hill behind it because we had to have a wall behind the stamp mill to attach, to stabilize these uprights. And so the first thing we did was scoop all this out and build the hill on the back. And then we built the forms for all these uh, cement pillars that the motor boxes are sitting on. And uh, we built all the forms. We used lots of rebar, 3,500 pound test cement. And uh, the one on the end that we were knew we were gonna run uh, was a little bit bigger than the rest of them. And uh, then we built the, uh, these supports on the side for the timbers that held the uprights. And then we put the uprights on, and then we put the, uh, the st stamps up in there after we put the cross member on top and uh, finished it up by making the roof. And using two boom trucks, we, uh, we raised and put the roof on because we never had any intention of putting it in a building, but it did need some, some protection from the elements, mostly the sun we were concerned about. So the roof was there just to take the worst part of the exposure to the sun uh, and, and protect it. So how come you never got it running? Well, we got it to this point, and at that point, Apache Land Movie Ranch burnt down, and we were do donated the barn and the, the uh, uh, Roddy Murphy barn and the Elvis Chapel, and we were given 60 days to get it out of there, and uh, we had a lot of trouble with that. Uh, the weather was terrible, and we lost about 30 days just due to weather, but we never got back to the stamp mill. And after I left the museum, these other gentlemen come in and they actually got it running. It was our intention to do that, but we didn't have an opportunity. So is this stamp mill similar to the ones that you'd find back in the day in Pinal City and uh, Silver King? Oh, the stamp mill was basically the same. The operation for removing the gold was entirely, uh, silver I should say, it was entirely different. Uh, this was built on a hillside, a very tall hillside. And uh, at the beginning, they used mules and pack panniers to bring the ore in, which was on the third level. And uh, there was an opening at the t on the third level at one end of the building that they could come in. Later, they had tracks and ore carts, but that's the way it started with, with mules. And that would be dumped into a grizzly. <laughs> Whoa, a grizzly? A grizzly is nothing but a set of bars a certain distance apart, and only certain size uh, ore would fall through the bars, and there'd be a guy or two there, the bigger pieces, they smacked them with a sledgehammer to get them through the, down to the fist size that they needed to uh, operate. And then it went from the grizzly into the jaw crusher. The draw crusher, there were several different types of draw crushers, but mainly they had a stationary plate, uh, sometimes on both sides, and the eccentric wheel would crush the rocks as that, that happened. And from the, uh, from the ore crusher, it went into the distribution um, system that's behind each one of these motor buckets. And this lever you see down there would dump a certain amount of ore into the, the bottom of the ore bucket each time that operated. And once this was crushed down from fist size to say um, pebble size, it would be pumped with water down to, um, it had two ball mills. However, the ball mills had been taken for scrap in World War II. Somebody managed to get them out of there. They were pretty large, but they did. And they also took a lot of parts off the uh, drive shafts and stuff, uh, the caps for the drive shaft for uh, scrap. And, but anyway, it went through two ball mills, which virtually uh, crushed the ore down to almost a powder. And then that would run down 
to the cyanide tank. And the cyanide tank had a very unusual uh, system on it. You can see it over here. This is all cut down in size to about a quarter of what size they really were. But they had a, a direct current system, electric system there. In fact, we even found some of the light bulbs that they were using, which were direct current. And this device was on top of each of the tanks. And the needle here, if it got, if the tanks, the slurry got too thick, it would go over and set off an alarm. And the guys working in the slurry tanks would then add water or whatever they had to to make that slurry just the right consistency. So they were constantly working on that down in the slurry thing. And then using that pump over there, that's the actual pump, they would pump up the, uh, it to the bullion room. And then over, over behind here is the, the, the um, uh, device that they melted the gold down into bars. And that's the way this operated. This is a, a massive structure, so what happened to the other mills similar to this? Well, I don't know exactly when they were torn down. I do know that uh, they had a 20-stamp mill at Pinell City, and I think the name of it was Pinell City Mill. But it was leased by the Silver King Mine. They didn't own it, they just leased it. And uh, it was during the wars, that the after the wars, that the price of copper dr and silver dropped so much that they, be they began to... Uh, uh, back off of the mining, but uh, they, the Silver King must have purchased uh, part of the mill because they moved 10 of the stamps up to the actual mine site. But I can't, I can't tell you what year that happened. This is a, a massive structure, so what happened to the other mills similar to this? Well, there, some of the foundations are there. The foundations and, are up there. And we might be able to find them. Yeah, and the foundations the, are there. But this was, the, the stamp mills were virtually the same. They weren't that much different. There was one at Goldfield, oh, okay. uh, Ghost Town too. Oh, okay. uh, it was the method with which they uh, reduced the ore and how they reclaimed the uh, silver and gold out of it that was different. Up there they had amalgamation tables and uh, they used borax and some other things. Uh, I mean, ore is different. At Bland, this was flower gold. It was very fine. And only cyanide uh, was used to, get, to extract the, the gold. Well, there you have it. Didn't I tell you, it's another special edition of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. Join us next time when we discover more about all those mysteries happening in those mountains. See you then.